we don't have a microphone, but I think uh, it's an academic hazard that people will be doing the talking today won't need one. Um, so let me uh, welcome you to this next in the series of uh, critical thinkers in the religion, law, and social theory, um, which is organized by Laurie Beeman, who isn't here, uh, and uh, André Liberté, who isn't here, and Pascal Fournier, who isn't here, and André Winter, who isn't here, but also by Sonia Sika, who is. <laughs> so she represents the organization. Um, its main sponsor is Laurie Beeman's uh, Canada Research Chair, but also along with Pascal Fournier's uh, Research Chair in Legal Pluralism and Comparative Law. Um, and it's, as you know, one in a series that is usually very well attended, as I'm happy to see uh, today's is as well. Uh, and therefore, again, I uh, very much welcome you to this. Um, today's, uh, our speaker today uh, is um, Dietrich Jung, and by the end of the lecture I'll, I'll want you all to be able to pronounce that properly, <laughs> um, who is uh, um, a professor and head of department at the, uh, if I can read this small print here, Center of Contemporary Middle East Studies at the University of Southern Denmark, um, which is, um, something beginning with O. Odense? Odense, that's right. Hans Gestern Andersen's. Yes, yes, which is obviously in southern Denmark. Um, <laughs> sort of. Uh, he holds a, a, his MA from Political Science and Islamic Studies, as well as PhD from the Faculty of Philosophy and Social Sciences at the University of Hamburg in Germany, um, which is where he's from, as you will soon know as soon as he opens his mouth. Um, and uh, but uh, his uh, his main uh, interest, or shall we say, background for uh, what he's going to talk to us about today, uh, is that he heads a a, um, a very significant uh, and a very interesting ongoing research project called the Modern Muslim Subjectivities Project, uh, subtitled Modernity, Subjectivities, and Islamic Traditions: uh, Religion and the Good Life in the Modern Muslim World. So. Um, <coughs> I'm not going to take uh, much more time to do some as to, but I have to say that uh, uh, he is a very uh, well-established and well-known figure in this field. Um, I have been to a number of conferences with him on these subjects. Uh, uh, it's a fascinating area and I'm sure that after his talk is completed today that we're going to have a lively and uh, complex discussion. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Yu. Thank you very much for this nice introduction and for organizing also the absent organizers, my thanks to, um, that I have the chance to speak to you here today, first time in Ottawa, I have to say for me, so if you think this has been a mistake, it's corrected today. Um, now what I want to tell you today or lecture on is based on my two recent books, um, which are sort of source of it, and then, as Peter already said, uh, is part of an ongoing project I'm conducting at my university. And the first one here, Orientalist Islamists and the Global Public Sphere, that's more the, the broader frame of reference, um, where I try to investigate into the, for me, for a long time, puzzling question why actually Orientalists and most of Islamists are imaging Islam in the very same way. Um, because they are normally not uh, the most easy bedfellows, but um, they do so, and I investigated about that and found out that this is not uh, only due to, let's say, asymmetric imperialist power relations, which they hold, um, but also to um, interlacements of discourses and, even more surprising, personal encounters of Islamic reformers and Orientalists. One of the most prominent encounters is a young um, Ignaz Goldzieher from Budapest, one of the founding fathers of Islamic studies with Jamal al-Din al and probably Mohammed Abdu in Egypt. In the other book, uh, Politics of Modern Muslim Subjectivities, with two um, co-authors and collaborators, we have conducted a study um, in Jordan and Egypt amongst uh, young people volunteering in welfare organizations or Islamic charities and uh, Islamically oriented youth groups. And it's basically more to this book I will refer to today. I will also come with uh, 
two quotes from the book. Now, before starting, I have to tell you something which is actually quite important. We are interested in the connection of Islamic identities with other kind of social imaginaries and the reference to religious traditions therefore plays an important role. That does not mean that the identity construction of all Muslims is predicated on that it's related to Islamic traditions. Um, the non-practicing Muslim is not an oxymoron. Um, there is something like a nominal Muslim born by Muslim parents, but then later not um, identifying or constructing his or her identity strongly with reference to Islamic traditions. But as we're interested in religion, um, we certainly have uh, this focus. And I say that because there is certainly in Islamic studies a very strong emphasis on piety movement, piety movements at the moment, um, which I think is interesting, but have also a critical stand. And now I do basically the same. And I have to uh, tell you why I'm doing that. And my major argument in the presentation today will be that the construction of Islamic modernities is not independent from larger global social imaginaries. So I argue that Islamic modernities are an inherent part of what I call global modernity. Let's go to the program. I will start with an autobiographical note because uh, I think this is important uh, to tell you why I do what I do. And as indicated here, I went a drag from what you could call romantic orientalism to analytical universalism. Then um, theory plays quite uh, a big role in here, social theory, so I have to talk a bit about what I conceive what is modern or modernity and how to use some of this um, also very contested terms. We will look then at successive modernities and the formation of Muslim subjectivities in, com in the comparative perspective to Europe, uh, how at least two representatives of the Islamic reform movement have done, and I will conclude with uh, some reflections on global social imaginaries and Islamic identities. Now, let me start with the autobiographical part. Scholarship, and that is very important, is not neutral. On the contrary, who engages in scholarly work is driven by personal attitudes and considerations. This applies to me as to any other scholar. So why did I personally end up becoming a scholar of Middle Eastern studies? Now, there is no doubt that I was partly drawn into the field of Islamic and Middle East studies by my romanticist, orientalist leanings of my youth. At least this is what I learned after having read Edward Said's Orientalism as an undergraduate. <laughs> Yet the intense study of social theory and Islamic history fundamentally changed my attitude to the Middle East. In barbarian terminology, I would label this change as a quick and lasting process of disenchantment. I was no longer looking for differences when in the Middle East, but discovering similarities. The Middle East of other became increasingly familiar and therewith akin. Let me illustrate what I mean. From August 1995 to July 96, I spent one year in Damascus. I received a grant from the German Academic Exchange Service to improve my knowledge in Arabic. In the 1990s, Syria was firmly in the iron grip of the late Hafiz al Azad. The puritanical Arab nationalist Syrian security state did not leave room for many distractions. Apart from outdoor dinners at the Nadi Omar, the so-called workers' club, without any workers, only foreign students, <laughs> and the um, Damascene middle class at that time, I often spent the evenings at home, reading journal 
novels. Now, this was not precisely why the Academic Exchange Service find, financed my stay in Damascus, but there was time for that. And the living conditions in Syria's non-entertainment society gave me ample room for both, brushing up my Arabic and filling the gaps in my knowledge of German literature. This literature was easily available at the library of the Goethe Institute in Damascus. And while reading these novels, I made Damascus the backdrop of their stories. For instance, I met Franz Bieberkopf, the central protagonist of, in Alfred Döblin's Berlin Alexanderplatz in Damascus. Left side, that's a book, um, English translation of, of this novel. And on the right side, you see um, Merche before the Civil War started in 2011. Now, playing in Berlin during the 1920s, the novel paints a rather bleak picture of the life of Germany's lower classes. In the social milieu of the Alexanderplatz Square, Bieberkopf was struggling to regain his feet after having served four years in prison. Similar struggles among immigrants, street vendors, handymen, petty criminals and prostitutes took place at the <coughs> election. To be sure, the Damascus of the 1990s was not the Berlin of the 1920s. Yet comparable structures of economic hardship, rampant unemployment, social uprootedness, and an arbitrary state security system made Damascus for me into a then contemporary stage of Alfred, Alfred Lubin's novel. The Syrian and the German Franz Bieberkopf were different individuals, but of a similar type. Since then, this understanding of differences by searching for similarities has driven my academic work. And it's certainly underneath this lecture as well. Now, when talking about Islamic modernities, we certainly should have a look at the terms we use and what is modern. I have here a sort of shopping list which um, I think are elements, institutional elements of modern times, but which is all too often used, in my opinion, uncritically. We talk about democratic systems, certainly market economy and capitalism, the modern sciences, technology, universal human rights, and societies with a, ref with a reflective approach to institution building. As I said, this is not wrong, but it's probably not the whole story. It's rather a sort of positive self-representation of what we used to call Western society. However, even within the so-called West, <coughs> the application of those elements only seems to be problematic. What is Western modernity? On the left-hand side, you see a picture from 1943 after Hamburg so had uh, two days of air attack by the Royal Air Force and more than 60,000 civilians have been killed in a firestorm. And on the right side, you have the Woodstock Festival and the expression of the peace movement. So these are two extreme features of 20th century Western history. And it's therefore why I say we should be a bit careful. As a German, I do not consider German Nazism as not being modern, as Nazist institutions not as modern <coughs> institutions, although they were very, very far from being democratic ones. Um, in addition, I would add Stalinism. It's not considered to be Western, but it basically with Russia belongs into the same camp of imperialist powers of Europe. And probably from a Muslim perspective, Russia figures more towards what uh, is the West, or Europe, or the colonial heritage, than to something like the East. So, it's difficult to define 
modernity 